These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. Well, um, to start with, how would we decide what type of mechanism we would get here? That would be SN1. SN1? And what was you thinking there? Oh, wait, wait, hold on. SN2, actually. Because mm -hmm. if, uh, in order to get the, the leaving group out, we need to have the carbon to be having as least number of substitution as possible. So uh, well, the most favorable uh, one would be the primary carbon. And mm -hmm. that's actually primary carbon. Right. right. That sounds good. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, good. Um, now, those are our good analyses. Basically, you're saying there's not very much steric hindrance, so we would expect there to be an SN2. That's a good analysis. Things can get a little subtle, though, so I have a, a handout with a table that hopefully helps with that. So, here's a handout with the table. All right, and this table here at the bottom of page three of the SN2 handout, this kind of gives an overview of how to decide what the mechanism is going to be. Um, so we can review how to use that here. So to figure out the right row, you want to look at your alpha carbon. Here's our alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is the carbon attached to the leading group. Well, is this primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary. Primary. Uh, there's a complication because notice actually the table has two different rows for primary alpha carbons. Uh, because even though there's not very much steric hindrance from the alpha carbon, there might be steric hindrance from the beta carbon over here. Uh, if the beta carbon was tertiary, we uh, actually would get a different result here. Uh, but what type of beta carbon do we have here? In this picture on the board. Primary, secondary, or tertiary for this compound on the board? Secondary. secondary. Well, that's not really enough steric hindrance to, to knock us into that, that special row. So there's a special row for primaries with tertiary beta carbons, because those have more steric hindrance. But th this, we can just use the normal primary. And then who is our nucleophilic atom going to be? The negative oxygen. And is it in a bulky base or a non-bulky base? Non-bulky. Non -bulky. Now, it's bulkier than hydroxide. But we talked last time about how when you say bulky, you usually mean something like tert butyl oxide, something very bulky. Well, this is not as bulky as tert butyl oxide. All right, so that would put us in um, the next to last column. So if we're looking at the third row, um, no, we're looking at the second row and the next to last column, it looks like our prediction was right. And this is going to be an SN2 reaction. OK. And then before we talk any more about that, what would be the reaction down here? What mechanism? That would be uh, an SN2. And your reason was? Uh, well, you have, um, you have uh, methyl carbon. Yeah. Yeah, who's our nucleophile? The nitrogen. Yeah, neutral nitrogen. neutral nitrogen. That's a big difference between that and a negative nitrogen. Here we have a neutral nitrogen as the nucleophile. So we're in the very first row of the table. The first row of the table is methyl alpha carbons. And we're in the third column. The third column has neutral nitrogen. So again, that would be an SN2. This kind of problem gives people trouble sometimes because notice that this is a little bit weird in that the nucleophile, the nucleophilic molecule, is bigger than the electrophilic molecule. Um, but that shouldn't mess us up. Remember, we're not supposed to draw something that's similar to what we've something, something that feels good. We're supposed, we're supposed to draw something that's in accord with the principles we've learned. So the size here doesn't really make much difference. All right, so this will also be SN2. Now, your particular question is, what about the ethanol and the acetone? Well, what's the role that the ethanol and the acetone are playing? Those are the solvents. I think we talked last time about how oftentimes it's conventional to write the solvent above the arrow. Um, so this would be this solvent, and this would be this solvent uh, over here. What role do they play? Well, uh, apparently they don't play any role in determining the mechanism, right? We determine the mechanism without seeing what the solvent was. 
usually you can determine the mechanism without paying attention to the solvent. Um, I don't know if that's always true in the lab, but that's usually true on homework and especially test questions. On homework and especially test questions, the determination of whether it's SN2, SN1, or E1, or E2 usually can be determined without paying particular attention to the solvent. That's why if you look at the table on page three, it doesn't mention the solvent. Um, okay. However, what is the role of the solvent? Well, the solvent could mean that this is either going to be a fast SN2 or a slow SN2. Some solvents can speed us up or slow us down. And there actually is a good chance you would see test questions about that. That is a popular topic. So the two different types of solvents are protic and aprotic solvents. A protic solvent is a solvent that can form hydrogen bonds. And an aprotic solvent means it cannot form hydrogen bonds. The, the name hydrogen bonds is kind of misleading because when, when chemists say hydrogen bonds, they don't mean norm, normal covalent bonds to hydrogen. Hydrogen bonds is a technical term. These are intermolecular forces, if you remember from general chemistry. So these are not hydrogen bonds even though they are covalent bonds between a carbon and a hydrogen, these are not what chemists mean when they say hydrogen bonds. When chemists say a hydrogen bond, because these are intramolecular, these are inside the molecule. Hydrogen bond is a technical term that refers to a, a, a bond between two separate molecules. And to save time, we won't go into too much of the details uh, here. Or, well, just to tell you, suppose that, that we had methanol, and suppose that I had another molecule of methanol. A hydrogen bond would be an interaction between the hydrogen on one molecule and the oxygen on a different molecule. That's why it's called intermolecular. You can see why they would interact, because the hydrogen has a delta positive and the oxygen has a delta negative. I think we already started talking about last time how the key to chemistry and organic chemistry is just the charges. Well, the partial charges here explain this hydrogen bond between these two things. All right, so this is not what is meant by a hydrogen bond. These dots represent a hydrogen bond. It's an intermolecular attraction. And the, the key thing to know is that these are strong intermolecular attractions, relatively strong intermolecular attractions between two separate molecules. Now, what types of molecules can form hydrogen bonds? It's not good enough to have hydrogens. You have to have OH or NH bonds inside your molecule. If the molecule has OH or NH bonds, then it can form hydrogen bonds to other molecules. has OH or NH covalent bonds inside of it, then it can form hydro intermolecular hydrogen bonds with other molecules. And if there is no covalent OH or NH bonds inside, it can't form those. Actually, you could also do hydrogen bonding if you had a OF bond, but that doesn't, um, I'm sorry, if you had an HF, but that doesn't come up in organic chemistry, so we won't worry about that. In organic chemistry, uh, we're not going to see HF, so these are the only types here that can give us hydrogen bonding. Okay. Um, so, um, we should ask who can form hydrogen bonds. So, can ethanol form hydrogen bonds? Yeah. Well, yes, it's got a hydrogen covalently bonded to the oxygen. Uh, now, here's acetone. Can acetone form hydrogen bonds? No. Now, this is where people get messed up because does acetone have hydrogens? Yes, it has tons of hydrogens. And does it have oxygen? Yeah, it has an oxygen, but it doesn't have any OH bonds. So it's not enough to have O and H. You have to have an OH covalent bond or an NH covalent bond in order to be able to form hydrogen bonds. Uh, so maybe this isn't a very good name because um, acetone is aprotic even though it has tons of protons. Aprotic doesn't mean no protons. It has tons of hydrogens. It really means no OH or NH bonds inside the molecule. So it's important to be able to look at any solvent and decide whether it's protic or aprotic. So is ethanol protic or aprotic? 
And acetone? Good. How about, say, water? Protic, because it has two OH bonds. How about dimethyl sulfoxide? Aprotic. It's got oxygen and hydrogens, but no OH bonds. This is a fairly common aprotic solvent, and it's oftentimes just abbreviated DMSO, so it's good to know that this is aprotic over here. Okay, so those are some examples of protic and aprotic.